Well, the state of Missouri just wrapped its legislative session, a session with what many saw as questionable judgment, poor decisions, even scandalous behavior. And that's just what happened inside the chambers. Outside of lawmaking, Missouri made headlines across the country and not in ways that anyone wants. Tonight, we'll recap what was and was not accomplished on both sides of the river and also ask, are our state governments governing well? Stay tuned. And on Stay Tuned, you drive the discussion. We bring local experts, journalists, and civic leaders together to have tough conversations for a stronger St. Louis. Tweet us your insights on tonight's topic, and you've got a seat at the table. With a few national experts and a panel of community members, this is the show bringing more light and less heat to the issues that matter. So stay tuned. going on. I'm not sure where to start, but I know who to start with. Jason Rosenbaum and Joe Manny's both of St. Louis Public Radio. Thanks for being here. Boy, I tell you what, um, have you have you seen a session like this before? And and while we might roll our eyes at some of it, obviously some of it was very personal and very tragic when we lost our state auditor and his chief of staff, but then it ended in scandal with our uh, Speaker of the House resigning after a text message scandal with a freshman in college. Ever covered a session like this, uh, Jason? No, not even close. Um, I think that, as you mentioned, that the death of Auditor Tom Schweik cast a pall over a lot of the proceedings. I don't think we've, at least in recent memory, I don't think we've been through a situation where a statewide office holder takes his own life. Um, and, you know, that set off a political flurry in and of itself. Accusations that there were. It was the low point of politics, I believe, our former senator. Right, Dan and you know, a, a, a lot of non-Jews talking about anti-Semitism as well. Um, but you know, I think that the last week as well was also really sad. And I want to emphasize that John Deal is by no means a victim. He clearly made some really terrible, questionable judgment here. But you know, we see this all the time in Missouri politics, where people kind of go through. Um, the ringer and their personal lives disintegrate in a very public way and it just both Joe and I have interviewed John Deal many times he's been on our podcast more than anybody else and it was just a sad kind of pathetic situation overall well some of the things I've seen before but in different circumstances but this session I think uh, was less affected by the, sh the Schweik sadness because the police reports had come out, the Republicans had started to move forward. Uh, they decided that it, what happened to Schweik was something that was personal to him as opposed to something that um, was going on outside. But what happened the last couple weeks is that for average viewers, may not get all this, but in the state Senate, there was a procedure that's rarely used, but it was basically used to kill a filibuster on a very touchy piece of legislation, right to work. And when something like that happens, uh, the losing side often gets extremely upset because this procedure known as moving the previous question is rarely used. And when it is used, it just takes a simple majority to block the debate. And usually when the Senate's done it, they've done it towards the end of a session not with about a week left to go. And when that happened on Tuesday night, the Democrats then were able to basically shut everything down for three days. So that killed tons of legislation, good and bad. Stuff they may have wanted to see pass or, or at least be at the table on. Correct. In yeah. fact, there very likely may be a legal fight this summer because uh, the General Assembly was in the midst of trying to override Governor Nixon's veto of a bill that reduced unemployment benefits. The House passed it on Monday. Because of the Senate, what happened in the Senate on Tuesday, the Senate never got around to it. They say that they're going to do it during the veto session. The governor says that under the Constitution, 
because the House acted during the session, the Senate had to do it too. So he's claiming his veto stands. Yeah. So you could see this fallout going on all summer, as well as the right to work business. Now, another effect, though, uh, as I've mentioned several times, in my opinion, and different people disagree, um, I think that D uh, John Deal's departure, because of the sex texts, as I call them, um, does <laughs> sexting. We, it's called sexting jokes. I know, I know, but I, I just called them sexy texts. And, you, and it's making you blush, and it probably should make us all blush. But I figure we've gotten. We've but I mean, it's sad because a 49-year-old man, and you should know better. Okay, but that said, the political fallout could be felt on the St. Louis area because Deal was from the St. Louis area. He was the second of two speakers who had were from the St. Louis area and had really helped, I think, set the table on various issues close to St. Louis. And with him gone, no matter how good Todd Richardson is, who's from Poplar Bluff, it's not the same as having someone in your own backyard. As the, okay, you've said the these, these are all, you've said a lot of things. I think we're going right. to have to dive into them uh, individually as we go on through the night. I just want to quickly, though, talk a little bit more about what went down in light of a GQ article uh, that came out. Did you see this, where they said House of Cards should be set in Missouri, House of Cards, for anyone yeah, who doesn't know, <laughs> Netflix show this uh, political drama bordering uh -huh. on, the, on the absurd. They're saying, given the session we just had. So in light of that, did someone try to take down uh, John Deal? Do we no, know? Is there a backstory took, that, I mean, we, that, that we don't know? He took know? down no. himself. Right. I mean, nobody put you know, pressure on him to engage in this obviously inappropriate Someone went to the newspaper, though. I mean, obviously somebody went to the Kansas City Star, but regardless of, you know, the timing or, or you know, the, the the details, I mean, even even he says he was at fault. I mean, I don't really think that it was... There was a, nothing he was he working on that people down. wanted him out of the out no, of office. Well, no, I, without getting into details, most of the rumors are that it was someone close to the young woman who had taken the screen text and then took him to the star because she was from the western side of the state yeah. and that's how this got started now her nickname for for deal was, was frank underwood speaking so, of house of cards so, the, the character who has a younger girlfriend yeah, although is, no is one's married. accusing him of pushing anybody onto the subway so. yeah <laughs> now, now i just started the, the series don't spoil it for <laughs> sorry. me sorry um spoiler alert he's a murderer <laughs> <laughs> sorry that's Underwood, a, that's not a, deal. Yeah, just to be clear. Okay, <laughs> to back, be. To re, back to reality, which is entertaining enough this past session. I want to go to a quote uh, from Governor Jay Nixon, who uh, had this to say about what we are talking. He said, sadly, the past week has been a jarring reminder of what happens when people lose sight of what they're here to do and who they're here to serve. Now that the session has come to close, members of the General, General Assembly face a choice of whether the past few days will simply reinforce how low expectations, reinforce the low expectations many Missourians already have for the legislative process, or whether these events will serve as a wake-up call to do better and act in ways that make Missourians yeah, proud. Joe and I were both at that press conference when he said it, and you know, we give the governor a lot of flack often, but I think that was one of the more eloquent things that he said in recent memory. Because, as I kind of alluded to on the outset, we do see these type of things happen on a lower level where, you know, somebody comes to the legislature, sometimes they come with a lot of promise, and their personal lives just disintegrate. I mean, the perfect example of that is former House Speaker Rod Jetton, a Marble Hill Republican who is arguably one of the most successful Republican speakers maybe ever. But if you read his book, he was totally out of control in his personal life. After he left, the legislature, it spiraled down even worse to where there were criminal charges against him because of a, a battery incident against a woman. And it just, I, I don't, again, I wanted to emphasize that these are, these are adults and they make decisions and often they make bad decisions, but, you know, unfortunately, for whatever reason, we see this type of thing happen over and over again. You have to wonder whether it's the people or the environment, and we could speculate all we can, but it's still bad decision making no matter what, so. I think some of it, I mean, aside from the, the long-standing problem in Jeff City or any other state capital where they're in a bubble and you can be very powerful in the bubble and nobody outside the bubble knows who you are. Yeah. But second, now we're in the age of social media. Uh, I mean, think about it. Uh, Deal was uh, outed and forced to resign over the publication of text messages. I can't imagine even five years ago, five years from, 
if something like that had come up where it would have involved text messages, where they've been able to substantiate anything. Yeah, let, mean, me, let me just put it in context a little bit. When Senator Matt Bartle was filibustering a, a gubernatorial appointee in 2007, he actually printed out blog comments in paper and read them on the floor, which was at the time like a, a visionary thing. Just think of how far we've come in seven or eight years where everything is instant on our phone. Okay, save some of these thoughts because these are topics we, want, we do want to delve into uh, later in the show. Uh, we'll, we'll keep that bubble idea that you have there and we'll revisit that. But first, let's uh, get a little bit into the issues of what, kind of what actually got done or maybe what did not get done. Uh, did anything get done? We have, I believe I have a graphic of bills that actually did pass. Mm -hmm. So what, what actually happened here, Joe? Well, we got, uh, one of the major bills, as, is, as far as uh, your viewers, would be uh, where the General Assembly overrode the governor's veto of a bill that passed that reduces uh, welfare benefits, uh, at least it, it imposes more requirements and changes the lifetime maximum from five years to three years and nine months. Um, they also did a budget early. One of the reasons they did the budget early was that th uh, the Republicans wanted to have time to override the governor's veto of any objections he had. You what, see school funding, just, to, just to finish off this graphic, school funding and managed right. care. Uh, managed care for folks that they did pass was? It's, 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 it's limited amount. I mean, it's not, it's not, we're not talking Medicaid not expansion. A, not a major accomplishment. No. Okay, and and then there, there was some movement on school funding. But I mean, there's there's movement Possibly. on school funding every year. They may add like 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 million dollars, and they say it's the highest funding ever. And depending on who you ask, it's it's important because it's more money. But you know, some but people would argue it's not it's revolutionary. Not. But it's still below what is supposed to be the funding that is supposed to be mandated by the state foundation formula, which is the major program that funds schools. The funding is still below that. And keep in mind, I don't know the exact number, so if I got that wrong, you can. You know, yell at me later. We, we, we'll edit you out. <laughs> um, okay, and, and so so bills failed. I just want to look at some of these things that we have here. Uh, we heard a lot about deadly force coming out of the quote unquote Ferguson agenda. Uh, there was ethics reform uh, at the Capitol itself, jobless benefits that failed, and Medicaid expansion. Well, failed. you mentioned the quote unquote Ferguson agenda, and there were I'm sure that other guests can delve in a little bit more to that. Um, because there were a lot of things that were purportedly inspired by the unrest in Ferguson that didn't pass. An update of the deadly force statute, uh, you know, mandates on body cameras, sensitivity training. Lots of things were actually introduced by members of the, the Missouri Black Caucus, and oftentimes they were re referred to committee too late, or they didn't get a hearing, or they weren't really seriously considered. The one bill that did get passed that many are saying was inspired by the Ferguson unrest is this overhaul of the municipal court system. And I think it is gonna be a, a major deal, for, especially for municipalities in St. Louis County. But you, I'm sure one of your guests, Senator Maria Chappelle Nadal, is gonna argue that not only is it not the you know, silver bullet to what happened in Ferguson, but you know, that those other things that I mentioned didn't get passed. And you know, I know she'll probably dwell on that more in the show. The municipal court uh, bill, I, th I contend, was a very major piece of legislation that passed because it does limit the amount of income that a, a community can receive from traffic fines and courts cough and stuff like that. Now, it may run into a court fight because they put different restrictions for St. Louis County than they did for the rest of the state. Yeah, and I gotta add though, because if you look at Ferguson's percentage, the estimates are anywhere 15, 16%, and the percentage is gonna be 12.5. That's the percentage of their revenue that Correct. you get from traffic. It's not traffic. actually gonna impact Ferguson right. that much. It's gonna impact mainly, you know. Smaller. Uh, smaller cities, maybe some cities like St. Anne, which has always been kind of Charlotte, castigated. St. John. Um, you know, Bella Villa in South County, but a lot of, you know, predominantly African-American African-American-led cities in, in largely North County are going to be affected. Not all of them, though, but perhaps some of them. Joe, I think you were skeptical the last time you were here uh, when we were talking about the legislative session as to whether anything of, of significance would get passed when it comes to this, the unrest in Ferguson, as we come to say. I think a lot of the other stuff, you know, well, it didn't. Now, the, now this, uh, the use of force uh, issue I think would have passed if it hadn't been for the Senate paralyzation. 
that you referenced it, earlier when they were retaliating, if you would, or, or fighting so, back. So a they bit. blocked everything. In fact, the House did pass a version the last day of session, even though everyone admitted that it was symbolic because the Senate was out. I mean, they came in briefly on Friday to pass a health care thing that had to be done, and then they went back out. So the um, use of force bill was a victim of circumstance. Some of the other stuff that just Jason mentioned would have died anyway, whether they had been other, in session or not. So yes. bringing it for full circle, uh, if we don't have the uh, Speaker of the House in a texting scandal, do things go a lot differently? Or no, no, I don't think so, because when they previous questioned right to work in the Senate, I think that pretty much um, effectively ended the legislative session there. And not Correct. to get too much in the weeds, but when you do stop debate in the Senate forcibly, you know, the minority party is going to respond in kind by, by basically blocking everything else. It happened in 2007 when they used the previous question last time during previous session. And the thing that I, I, I kind of don't understand is many of the Republican senators were in the House in 2007 and they saw what the consequences of using the previous question was. Now maybe they weren't paying attention that much because they were in the House. But I would be very surprised if any of them are surprised that was the outcome, no matter what they said. Yeah, I'm using an old analogy here, but what happened to Deal was kind of the sizzle in the last week, but what happened in the Senate was the stake, okay? That would have been the so, main story, clearly. Yes, I mean, what happened in the Senate really set the stage of what passed and what didn't pass. Deal's uh, debacle just added this whole melodrama. But it was, it was significant because there is a new speaker, Todd Richardson of Poplar Bluff, and I think a lot of people are very optimistic about his reign from both parties. We'll hold it there and cross the river to Illinois. Thank you very much. We're going to come back. We'll talk. We've got a couple of topics you guys have touched on that we want to kind of broaden out and dive a little deeper into. So thank you very much, Joe, uh, Joe and Jason. Uh, as we said, let's go across the river and hear from our friend at Illinois Public Radio, Amanda Vinicky. Joining us again is Amanda Vinicky. She's the State House reporter for Illinois Public Radio. Well, Amanda, I've been seeing the Illinois legislature is described as a murky mess. Does that sound right to you at this point? It sounds just about perfect, actually. There is this new governor, Bruce Rauner. So part of it is just the legislators and the governor feeling one another out, trying to figure out, all right, how far is he going to go? How will these negotiations play? What really does the governor stand for? So there's that. And then, of course, there's also Illinois' budget situation, court ruling on pensions. That situation is even tougher, more grievous than it started out. Let's do a little bit of the background on that. There was a 2013 law that was designed to reduce pension benefits. Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. That was part of the deal, right? That was the Supreme Court not only said you can't do this law, they were really pretty darn far scolding the legislature for even attempting to reduce benefits and pointing to a clause in the state constitution. So it was really a scathing 38 page opinion and it leaves the legislature with not a whole lot of options and choices of course illinois has a hundred billion dollars in unfunded pension liability so that also undermines governor rauner's plan which he'd counted on about two billion dollars in saving that's a huge chunk of the, the on top of cuts that he's already planning to make for the coming fiscal year budget it really is this big mess and you know you talk some union members that are celebrating this they say we didn't do anything wrong our benefits are protected hooray and on the other hand legislators some of them I talk to honestly like teary because they don't know what it leaves situation in the city of Chicago as well a couple of things yeah. um, Metro East um, watches the gambling legislation uh, horse racing and uh, the gambling boats. Uh, anything you think going to move uh, on that this year? That may be one of the areas where you could place a bet, and <laughs> get a return on your money, because again, Illinois just needs revenue at a time when taxes are still a dirty word. No politician likes to go there. Gambling, kind of one of those sin user taxes that there is some openness to. The governor himself says that he's no fan of gambling personally, but he wouldn't stand in its way if there's an agreement and it's well thought out. Uh, 
there, the General Assembly has passed several gambling packages before that would allow for five new casinos, and also it would allow for gambling at horse race tracks. Uh, of course, the existing casinos, so the Casino Queen, no big fan of that, but Fairmont wants it. It's a lot of those sort of just discussions that could hinder a deal this time around. But again, when Illinois is looking for revenue, if the governor is going to say no to taxes, this may be a way it could actually get through. So I wanted to ask you about uh, Governor Rauner distributing uh, some, what, $400,000 out of his own campaign fund. It is no surprise that the governor has a whole lot of money and that he isn't afraid to use it to help his friends and to hurt his enemies. He ran for office saying that. That's how he got elected. And even before he was inaugurated, he had $20 million in his campaign fund for just that use. What did raise a lot of eyebrows was the timing. It came as the Illinois legislature took up a controversial vote on right to work, something that unions are really fighting against. It wasn't actually the governor's legislation, so Republicans were really wary. It gets kind of messy there. Again, that murky mess. At the same time as those checks from Rounder were going out, the speaker had a huge fundraiser where he collected some thousands and thousands of dollars himself. So Missouri is wrapped up. Illinois has got uh, another week. I don't know if they've got a, a week's work of actual work to be done, if we'll see a lot more, but it'll be a busy week for you. Amanda Vidicki, State House reporter for Illinois Public Radio, thanks again for joining us on Stay Tuned. Okay, let's talk to some lawmakers who are actually there, now that we have a sense of uh, what the journalists thought of the past legislative session. Uh, joining us back on the show, uh, thanks to all of you for coming back. Uh, Senator Maria Chappelle Nadal, Democrat from St. Louis County, Representative Michael Butler from St. Louis, a Democrat, and Representative uh, Shmed Dogan from Ballin, Republican. Uh, Shmed, first time in office in, at the state level. What surprised you about working in state government? Well, it's been really interesting because I went on this show before the session. Yeah, I remember. And one of the things that I thought was going to be really a hot topic was Ferguson issues. And it turned out that we did not have nearly as much uh, debate and nearly as many bills on those issues coming forth on the floor as I thought. And uh, that was really surprising to me. Why, why do you think that was? I think there wasn't a lot of consensus on some of the issues like body cameras. I think there's a lot of questions still about whether or not we should have any kind of um, a unfunded mandate on police departments across the state on that. Um, the question of funding, I think, might end up at the federal level. Um, there's some talk, I know, from the federal government to fund body cameras. Um, the use of force bill, that was really disappointing to see that not get across the finish line. Hopefully, we can uh, uh, look forward to working with the senator on that next year and uh, getting a good bill on that passed. Was there um, enthusiasm on the, part of, on the part of your fellow Republicans for any of these issues? I think the use of force bill is something, it, it did pass the House, it just didn't make it because of the filibuster that happened. Would it have on, passed the if there side? was a chance it would get taken up in the Senate, as we just heard? Do you think you, you I, think it would have still passed if they knew it could be of any consequence? I think I think it would have. Is that the way you saw it, be, I, sitting in the same chamber? I was sitting in the same chamber when the uh, Speaker of the House came and spoke at the beginning of the session, and he said, no Ferguson agenda. When, the, uh, when he spoke about law enforcement, every single Republican got up and applauded uh, tremendously for law enforcement. This was a Republican party that came into session trying to take the law enforcement lobby from the Democrats. And they would do whatever they can to make sure that they did everything that law enforcement wanted and nothing that the protesters and the people of Ferguson and the people in St. Louis County wanted. That's what I saw. And I saw that from day one. I saw it play out in the committee, played out on the floor, and it even played out with the use of force bill on the last day of session. In that bill, it says that you can use deadly use of force to effect an arrest. I don't know how you arrest a dead person. But using deadly force and passing a bill allowing law enforcement to kill people to arrest them does not sound like something that is going to get any consensus at all or even make it through the Senate. What can make it through the Senate? Well, I do believe that if we were allowed to go to conference on the deadly force bill, we would have been able to take out all of the, the nuclear language that was in there. What was important is that we updated our statutes. We had not done that. There was a change with the U.S. Supreme Court, not only in 1985, but then again in 1989 with the, the terminology usage of objective reasonableness, which is what uh, Justice Rehnquist 
most wanted. That's what we were able to get into that language of deadly force. Get, get, into, get into line with the federal standards. Absolutely. And we were able to do that um, leaving the Senate. And because of the blockage and the shenanigans in the last three days of session, four days of session, um, we were not only able to get to a conference committee on the deadly force bill to take out all of the nuclear language, but there are many bills that should have been passed that were not. Shenanigans on whose part? Are you talk, calling out your own party? I'm calling out everyone uh, because there, there's no other Senate district that has as many problems as mine. We have the Westlake landfill, 46,000 tons of uranium. I have two unaccredited school districts, Riverview and Normandy, and then I have hashtag Ferguson. And so I was definitely committed um, more th than most people, and we had a lot of support from senators, rural and urban. When it came to Ferguson legislation, we were able to pass out four pieces of legislation, or three pieces of legislation from the Senate to go to the House, but only one of them finished and ended up on the governor's desk. But I, I do feel that we missed a unique opportunity. And when I talk about shenanigans, um, the Republican Party should have known. If the governor was going to veto a bill and they did not have enough votes to override the governor's veto, then something was going to happen. You're talking about right to work. The right to work bill. Um, and obviously that is a very important bill to debate on the Senate floor and on the House floor. But again, if you know that the governor is going to veto that bill and there are not enough um, votes to override that veto, I'm trying to figure out are the Republicans playing checkers or are they playing chess? And it looks like in the last week of session the Republican Party was playing chess. So what happened? You, ha you, you listed a lot of things that you'd like to have seen done just in your district. There are a lot of, I'm sure everyone else feels similarly about their own. Mm -hmm. What's the problem? Wh where is the lack of functionality or was there a lack of functionality? I think you have to look at it from both sides. There was good legislation that didn't get passed. On the other hand, there was a lot of bad legislation that didn't get passed. I know last year there was a lot of controversy over the so-called Friday favors, which passed on the last day. And I just know it's very common for the legislature in past years to get through these huge bills where they basically ask members of the House, okay, vote on this now and then find out what's in it later. So we didn't have that happen. So I thought from a process standpoint, it was good. It, you know, you hate to see things shut down, but sometimes it might be a little bit better than passing bad bills. Well, what happened was we cut back on a lot of the decades of good legislation that has made this state and, and the country great. For some reason, right to work still coming up. For some reason, we're cutting back unemployment benefits. For some reason, we're cutting back, back TANF benefits for those that need it the most. So uh, this year, I, I, I realized as a state representative, I was reminded, I grew up poor. I grew up in the city of St. Louis. I grew up with not a lot. And everything that has been cut back, and that's throwing not doing anything on Medicaid expansion, I would not be a state representative. I would not be here today if it, if it weren't some of the programs that the Republicans are cutting back and have made it a point to cut back when they have 117 members. That's what happened. What happened is that we passed a lot of tax credits and tax deductions for business, and we cut back on, on, on benefits for the poor. They we get 117 members. Go, go ahead, Rip. We actually didn't pass nearly as many tax credits as we, as we have in past sessions. And I think with the welfare reform bill, what we did is basically caught up with what 49 of the other states have been doing. We were ranked 50th in a Heartland Institute study, 50th in terms of getting on board with the 1996 welfare reform law, which requires people to look for work if they're going to get government benefits. That's common sense. That's something that Bill Clinton, you know, I think it's really interesting the way that your party has moved so far left. I wonder if Bill Clinton could win a Democratic nomination I now. I don't, well, actually, I don't legislate based on the Heartland Institute. I, I, I and <laughs> and I have to tell you, it was actually a Democrat who wrote the legislation that the president, President Clinton, passed, and that was Joe Maxwell. And so President Clinton took the language from Joe Maxwell, mm -hmm. the former lieutenant governor, and that's what became welfare reform. So it did start with the Democrat. So is there a larger question here about, for, I mean, for one, they have 117 members, as you mentioned, so there are a lot of people in the state, presumably, that agree with the legislation they're passing. Is there something to be said about the way it's functioning, though? It, 
I have to tell you, I've been in the building for 15 years, and I worked for the former lieutenant governor, and I have always been on the Senate side with the exception of my time, my three terms in the House, and never have I seen a, a last week of session that looked like this. There was never a time where the Senate shut down all conversation, all debate, and what happened is that ta taxpayers in the state of Missouri were cheated. They were literally cheated from Democrats and Republicans because, yes, there were some good bills that were out there. I know I had a nursing home bill that I've been trying to pass for eight years now, and there are some bad bills that were out there, too. But every single bill deserved to have a debate. And when we shut down the Senate process, what we have been doing for the 15 years I've been in the building, that really destroyed the integrity uh, that taxpayers in Missouri are really asking for. Functionally as well, there was not a lot of input on the budget. Um, this was the first time I've ever seen, and I'm sure first time in a very long time, that there were no changes to the budget on the House floor. Um, with the over 100 members in the Republican Party, not one wanted to put in anything for their districts on the House floor. So that means that just a few people, just the House leadership, and from what I hear, not even everybody on the Budget Committee got to shape the $24 billion budget that we have. So just a few people are spending all of our tax dollars. And we're not getting any input from those that need it most. And let me remind you that we're cutting the budget for po people, the poor people that need it most all across the state. I, I thought functionally that was a very surprising move to rush through the budget process, not let everybody weigh in, and uh, just let a few people decide for everyone. And Michael's right. In that budget, I actually wrote a letter to the governor, and I told him about all of the pork projects that were in the budget, several pork items and I was concerned about that because I was also asking for a million dollars for people in the Ferguson community for mental health services because they had not gotten them and not only did I not get that million dollars but um, in House Bill 12 there was 900 or 775 thousand dollars that went to the Ferguson Commission and we still don't know how they're utilizing money and then there was another um, uh, two million dollars that went to a park in Kansas City. While we're dealing with people who are not getting an adequate education, we're dealing with um, mental health services for a community that has been traumatized and injured in multiple ways, I could not get a million dollars, and that's just tragic. So while there was pork, uh, and I wrote this to the governor, there was a, a lot of examples of pork going to special projects, a farmer's $250,000 going to a farmer's market. The farmer's market around my block, around my house, has been in existence since 1973. Why are we establishing a new fund for $250,000 for a farmer's market in Jefferson City. That just doesn't make sense. We'll leave it there for now, because I think we have more to talk about uh, with all three of you. But uh, we're going to move on for just one minute, because we want to get to the hashtag. You mentioned hashtags. We're going to get to hashtag stay tuned, STL. See what you're saying. Thank you. Don't go too far. back with us. Uh, Mr. Dogan stayed, stayed with us. And uh, Andy Theising, professor and chair, 
uh, Southern Illinois University of Edwardsville Political Science Department. Thanks for being back on the show as well. Let's talk about that bubble you mentioned earlier. Uh, what, what is life like in the bubble? Is there a bubble when you got to Jefferson City for the first time? I think there definitely is, and I do have the vantage point of having worked for Senator Jim Talent in Washington, D.C., having experienced something pretty similar in Washington, where people really think that Washington is the center of the universe. Um, and to a large extent, economically, it is. We send billions and billions, actually trillions of tax dollars there, and they spend it. And with power um, comes, I think, a lot of uh, abuse of that power. And I think you see that on a micro scale in Jefferson City. Uh, so how, it, it, what was your impression of the, the Jefferson, Jefferson City version? I, I just is it working? Is it, is it dysfunctional? It, it works to a certain extent, but it's a pitfall. Um, anytime you have a culture in which um, you get a lot of elected officials with big egos and with a lot of money to spend and with a lot of lobbyists, um, there's potential uh, for people to abuse that system. Um, and no campaign contribution limits, uh, term limits. How do those things factor in, do you? Uh, I'll, Andy, I'll throw it to you. Uh, I, I really do think that what we saw in this session of the legislature shows that term limits have really not worked for the state of Missouri. We, uh, we, we have too much new legislative, uh, we don't have that talent, we don't have that experience base, we don't have the lifelong friendships that used to exist. Um, I think that hurts. I think that hurts in the ability to make deals. I think it, it hurts in the in the ability to 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 be productive. Well, of course, um, we wanted term limits at one time, right, Joe? Because we thought that these were uh, 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 immovable institutions. These individuals had become. Yeah, but and that's true. And it did remove uh, some people that maybe needed to be moved out. But one of the effects of this is that the power base, the um, memory, the people who know how things operate, it's no longer in the chamber, it's outside the chamber. It's the lobbyists who wander around the third floor of the Capitol, many of whom are former legislators, uh, who are beholden to certain businesses or other groups who've been hired to lobby for or against certain pieces of legislation. It's them and the bureaucrats who now are the people who are around the longest and so you had a shift in power. They're the ones who know stuff. And the legislators of both parties, um, often not only are they more beholden to their donors, because their donors are now telling them, you've got to vote on this while you're here. Um, I can promise you a job, or this or that when you're out. Um, they're beholden to that, but also they often tend to be, and this can be a good or bad thing, uh, many people are elected with a certain uh, philosophical views, strong views on how they think government should run. And because they're not there long enough to maybe see where maybe there's some sort of compromise, it doesn't happen. So you have more of a polarization uh, between the two parties, uh, between urban and rural, I mean, all the different factions in Jeff City, because nobody's there long enough to forge these relationships that the professor was talking about. Correct me if I'm wrong, you can do three terms in the House, two years each. You can do four, or two years, two four terms. Four terms in the House. Four terms in the House. Two years each. And, and then two terms. Two terms in the Senate, four years each. For a total of 16 years. Yes, if, if and, you, and that's if you move from chamber to chamber, and only right. a fraction of House members are going to end up in the Senate. And the House is 163 members, the Senate has 34. Is that pressure real that she's talking about from the outside forces of people who know the machine that are not actually the elected officials? I think there's some of that, but I think we're naive to think that lobbyists didn't have a whole heck of a lot of influence before term limits or that they don't have a lot of influence in Washington, D.C., where there's no term limits. Um, there's, there's always pluses and minuses to things like term limits, but I think they help people like me who are younger, um, people who are just coming from uh, regular professions um, we're supposed to have a citizen legislature, and I think term limits are one of the best ways to ensure that you get regular people and not career politicians who are there for 20, 30, 40 years, like up in D.C. Uh, what about the geography? So I, I brought up GQ with you and Jason earlier, <laughs> but they, they didn't just, it wasn't just a, uh, uh, you know, just an entertainment article. They quoted a uh, piece out of the American Economic Review written by a Harvard professor in part that says geography is actually a factor. Isolated U.S. state capitals cities are associated with higher levels of corruption, and that's because there's a lack of accountability 
the farther a capital is located from media organizations and the electorate. Is the fact that they are on a geographic island factor into the way that capital functions or does not function? I think the media point is important there because, because there, there are no statewide media. It's, it's uh, you know, major metropolitan areas have, have uh, news programs, but, but there is no statewide one. And so state capitals, particularly those that are located in, in, in the middle of a state in the rural areas, they, they tend to get less coverage than, than in the big cities. Well, Jefferson City is somewhat of an island. I mean, it was created because it was halfway between Kansas City and St. Louis along the Missouri River back move, before highways. <laughs> uh, move, move, move the capital from St. Charles, I believe. Right, correct. So, and it's it's a really neat city, small town uh, flavor, and people should go visit it. But it do, it is a bubble. And so there's a huge percentage of the population who either is in government or works for government. and as a result, it's, it's very much a company town. And I think if you're, let's say, speaker, or you're head of the Senate or whatever, you're a big shot in that town. Now, this goes back, you know, decades. But you often had people who are big shots in Jeff City who aren't known outside of Jefferson City. That's one of the differences between it and Washington. I mean, Jim Talent was well known outside of Washington as well as in Washington. Uh, in Jefferson City, you can have most of the major players outside of the governor who really aren't known at all outside of Jefferson City, and that only comes into play when uh, they're running for office or a higher office or something else, and they, and they believe because they've been treated like a big shot in Jeff City that somehow they're going to be so well known or somehow they're going to be able to get all these donors or this or that outside of Jeff City, and it doesn't happen. And I've seen that time and time again. The record of Missouri House speakers who've been elected to something else is really low. Most, Most people, on the, at least on the other side of the state, probably didn't know who John Deal was before the Kansas City Star uh, story. Correct. In fact, probably even many in the St. Louis area, even though he's from the St. Louis area and a prominent lawyer. Yeah. Um, okay, so ethics reform, that was on the don't or did not pass side of the graphic we had earlier. Is that important? Do we need that? I think it's more important than ever now. Um, I think what happened with the speaker really diminishes the whole profession of politics. Uh, it makes people think that people like me are in it for different reasons than we actually are. The profession may have not had much farther to go in the downward direction, <laughs> I don't know. It can always go further. I mean, like congressional approval ratings, right? They're in the single digits, I think. Um, they could always go down to just friends and family. Uh, but I just don't want us to be headed in that direction. And I think um, ethics reform is one of the things that I pushed for when I was a Baldwin Alderman. Um, and I was really glad that I was able to get an amendment onto our broader ethics reform bill um, in the House requiring uh, local elected officials basically to be governed under the same disclosure laws that we are. We have unlimited gifts, but at least if I take a meal from a lobbyist, I have to disclose it so somebody can say, oh, you took $24 from such and such, or you went out with someone for $100. Right now, local officials can take up to $500 of any type of gift, and they don't even have to disclose it under our state law. Um, the, the scandal that's brewing there, I think, is one that uh, journalists should pay attention to. Well, and I think he, uh, the representative brings up some good points. However, um, even if the ethics legislation had passed, which frankly had very little chance, even though there were some Republicans who were sponsoring it, um, it wouldn't have affected what happened to him. He still, I mean, it, there, there was nothing about text messages in the ethics uh, bills that were before the General Assembly. But it might have affected the atmosphere, at least the sense that uh, people want to see some change. But that wasn't going anywhere even before the last week where everything blew up. Sounds like you're saying there's no will to self-police. Well, there's a will among some, but the problem is they haven't had a will among enough. And some of it, and I, I'm, not for, I'm not saying I'm for or against term limits, but the fact is that term limits does, I think it reduces the um, urgency for it because you've got people who are like, well, this isn't going to affect me. I'm only going to be in the house eight years. I'm not, why would this affect me? And in some cases, they're like, well, it'll affect me because I want to be a lobbyist after I get out. And this would make me wait a year or two, depending on the bill. And they don't want to do that. So it, it, it doesn't, um, the legislation hasn't had enough strong supporters who have stuck with it. Uh, I mean, the last major bill was passed in 2010, and it had some good stuff in it, but it got tossed out by the Supreme Court on unrelated 
matters, and it, that hasn't come back. Uh, Andy, are the state governments, is Missouri state government, Illinois state government, are they um, maybe perhaps more in Missouri where there might be um, less of an appetite for federal programs? Are they, are they flexing their muscles a little bit these days? Uh, we, you hear a lot of talk about government intrusion from the federal level, but in, and then at the same time, uh, they are not afraid to ban a ban on plastic bags in Columbia, Missouri, or, and, and flex their muscles in other municipalities. The state of Missouri really is flexing its muscles, and I would argue Illinois is, is, is going that direction as, as well, but the state of Missouri really has uh, stepped up and, and made, its, made its disagreement with, with Washington known. Um, it's also taking a closer look at the local level. I, I think that there's, uh, I think that the state has to be a little bit careful because the state does create cities and a lot of cities are in distress. And if the state starts, starts saying, hey, you know, you really are creatures of the state and you have to listen to us, I think that the state also takes on a little bit of a, of a burden to fix some of those problems that have happened since they created all those cities. Is that a, is that a, is that a priority of yours uh, to distinguish between the rights of the state government and the, and, the, and the role of the federal government? Is that, because I hear that from your party oftentimes. Right, I think what it really comes back to is the rights of the individual. Um, one of the things that um, I was in support of that didn't make it over the finish line was preventing the uh, taxi cab regulations that prevent Uber and Lyft uh, from operating. There was a great article in the Business Journal um, I think by the guy who started Locker Dome saying that it was just flat out embarrassing that we don't have those type of ride sharing services. We're the largest city in the country that doesn't and that's an issue where local government has taken it upon itself to tell you as an individual that you can't ride in a car with this person because there's a cartel out there who benefits from the system as it is. I think uh, something like that uh, protects individuals. Looking at something like raising minimum wages, um, one of the things we hear over and over from business is that they don't like the system of 92 municipalities because it's 92 sets of laws that they have to live under when they're trying to do business here. And uh, things like a minimum wage, can you imagine crossing the street and having to pay a different mini minimum wage in one municipality from another? So I think it is the prerogative of the state government to step in in some of those situations and say, we're going to have a uniform state rule so that people can have certainty and can live uh, as free as they want to. State governments are kind of right in the middle there, if, if, at least maybe in your perspective. If you're in, you are trying to exert your power or, or your independence from the federal government and your power over the cities, as you said, that you've created. But you know, keep in mind that it was state governments that came together, wrote the Constitution that we live under, and gave up state power, gave that to the national government. States used to coin money. States used to run run the military and so they gave that power up to the national government. So his, if we go back a couple centuries, states really do have this very powerful role. Um, it's diminished a lot over a couple centuries and there are some states, Missouri and Texas certainly, that want to flex some muscle. Okay, I've totally gotten us off track on a philosophical discussion, but I enjoyed it. I thank you for your perspective. Let me take a break. Uh, we Once again, Joe, you've brought up like three things I think that we want to, we definitely want to touch on. We'll get everyone back at the table, but in the meantime, hashtag stay tuned STL. Okay, Jason, I want to get you back in on the conversation as well as our uh, elected representatives are back. Uh, we're talking about power. Joe, you kind of mentioned there's been a shift. We've often talked about rural versus urban on this show. Now that the leadership is changing, how does that, what, what impact will that have well, on the St. Louis area? Let's I, be, let's be uh, selfish here for a minute. We are uh, very selfish according to the Kansas City Star. <laughs> by the way. Um, I'm not going to say that it's not going to make any impact because I think when you have somebody who is from your area, 
Um, you know, there might be an, an, an advantage there. But I think that this whole idea about, you know, St. Louis losing influence because you're going from Deal to Richardson might be a tad, you know, overstating things. Uh, Todd Richardson handled the bill that actually enabled the arch tax in St. Louis. And whether, you know, it was by design or whether somebody told him to do it is kind of irrelevant. It kind of shows that, you know, he was willing to carry something for the St. Louis area. And for good or bad, depending on what you think of Paul McKee, the person behind the land assemblage tax credit, or at least the person that sponsored it in 2007, was Ron Richard from Joplin. So that shows that if people who want to move up and get in leadership, because he was Speaker of the House after that, they have to pay attention to the, the urban areas because it's kind of a necessity to not only you know, pass a, a broad agenda, but also to just mollify people within their own caucus. Although I think, uh, Jason and I have had an intellectual disagreement on this, because I think it could have a, more, a bigger impact than some believe. And I think uh, an example of this is the fact that uh, Sen State Senator uh, Mike Parsons, who's from um, southwest Missouri, who now is running for governor, has been very specific. I interviewed him. He believes that he can win as the next governor without the urban areas. He looks at how um, the right to farm uh, constitutional amendment passed despite opposition in the urban areas, and he sees that as a template for how a rural candidate could win statewide without the urban areas. And that does have, I mean, whether he's right or wrong, that does have an impact as far as the urban areas, seeing that, where someone is saying, I think I can win statewide and I don't need you. And I think that will affect uh, decision making in Jeff City if, if people are like that are successful. We have a clip of some of you oh, no. who were here previously talking about what might happen in the time since you were here and now. So I want to roll this clip. I'll uh, meet somewhere in between, meet this press and John Stewart with a uh, fraction of the budget of both, um, and, and just get your reaction to what you said then. So let's take a look at you guys then. Most of the, the, those proposals will go nowhere. I'm not saying Ferguson whether I like them or not. Yes. Proposals. And I, I'm not saying whether I like them or not. I'm just saying the reality of the political environment in Jefferson City is such. The bottom line is you've got a lot of legislators who privately say nothing's going to happen, or if something does happen, it'll be minor. I think education is probably the best example we have in the last couple of years of how we try to work together. Is that your top priority going in, uh, legis or excuse me, education? It's one of our priorities. I would say that we also have to look at policy that will positively impact Ferguson. But I do have to say in that, education is the foundation of everything. Okay, so just so you know what we're doing, we like to have the post show where things are a little looser on the show and just a little technical housekeeping there, apologize. Uh, thanks, Eddie. We appreciate that. Um, so something that was t we were talking about there, and we've touched on it some, you said you were surprised there wasn't more of a Ferguson focus when you got to Jefferson City this session. Uh, were you surprised at all? Was there, Andy, I'm, I'm curious, get your thoughts, kind of looking at this from the other side of the river at SIUE. Were, were any surprises from what was expected to what actually happened? Well, I, Speaker Deal specifically said this will not be a Ferguson agenda this, right. this year. I live in his district, by the way. You have, you have um, perspective of both sides of the river. Both sides of the river. So you have there. no representation now. That's, right. that's true. You have that's no representation. True. I the, adopt the people. So you <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think that some of the predictions, and particularly about education, there was some education bills that made it through. There was some education funding that was increased. Um, maybe not by what it needed to be, but but something got through. So in that sense, I think that that uh, it did turn out like it was supposed to. But I'd like to go back to this urban-rural split because if you look at the bills that didn't pass, they were by and large the urban issues that, that did not make it through. And I think that's very telling. And the fact that, that you know, the one, met, the one leader from, from the metropolitan area who, who, uh, who we had is now out of power. So things are maybe changing. People are, you're shocked that they would even bring up right to work, but Again, there's a large majority of Republicans, and if they want it, maybe things are just changing. Things have, if there are shifting, maybe. Well, typically, you know what is going to come up, and in November and December, we did know. We had an interest. Obviously, I wanted to see Ferguson legislation pass, but we didn't know what was going to come up. Typically, there is a deal that's made um, either between two caucuses or just within one caucus, and there was never any clarity in that. 
And I think in the Senate, at least, I cannot speak for the House, but House Bill 42, the transfer bill was very, very important, and it was one of the pieces of legislation that we put as a priority in the Senate, and we were able to send that out and work with the House. But when it comes to other pieces of legislation, I just don't know what the focus was supposed to be. We missed out on a grand opportunity to put our state in a different direction on the right path, especially when it comes to the treatment of individuals who have been harassed for so many years, decades and generations. Well, I, I think the geographical shift is, there's another third uh, geogra geography in there, and that's urban, rural, and suburban. And we have to remember that, that mm -hmm. uh, suburban issues are much different from those in high urban areas and then in rural. And even on the issue of education, urban and rural legislators tend to agree in the House at least. And they have pretty much stood tall on supporting public education and, and going against some of the bills, including for quite a few people that voted against House Bill 42 this year, House Bill, Senate Bill 493 last year. But the suburban legislators tend to rule the day. What the suburban legislators want tend to be what uh, goes gets to the Senate. That tends to be the shift we're seeing now. That rural legislators are they're representing a lot of poor folks. They they don't matter as much. Urban legislators represent a lot of poor folks. They don't matter as much. Suburban legislators tend to represent the money in the in these areas, and they get a lot of pull. You see that from yeah. the outside looking in. I think to some degree. Now you you look at St. Louis County though, and St. Louis County is is kind of an urban suburban mix, even though it's a county. So I think that's one of the reasons there had been hope among some that some of the Ferguson issues mm -hmm. would have been brought up. Now, in that clip you played, I did predict a lot wouldn't happen. Uh, but the big bill, which was the court reform bill, as Jason has written extensively about, did pass. And I think that could have some impact down the road, assuming that there isn't a court fight. Because to me, I just think there could be uh, constitutional problems because they're imposing stricter limits on communities in St. Louis County than in rural Missouri. Okay, we'll leave it right there. We'll pick up the conversation in about 10 seconds online. Until next time, Phil, on the air, stay tuned. I'm glad you stuck around we for the picture. You. There will be pictures. Okay, we're back on the web. Uh, Jason, you've been awful quiet by, as a, a function of the table. What, what uh, have you been reporting on that we, you can give us a sneak peek on or that maybe isn't getting enough play? Well, one of the stories that's going to come out on Tuesday is just kind of a, a deeper dive into Senate Bill 5, the Municipal Courts Bill, and, you know, the impact of it on, you know, particular communities in St. Louis County. I actually got to talk with the mayor of Northwoods, who is uh, sending out flyers about how they may be getting rid of trash service or possibly laying off people. Because, because, it's, of because they'll lose money. But I've, also talk, but I've also talked to proponents of this bill who say that, you know, for, for too long a lot of these cities have been too dependent on, on fines and court costs. But I've, I've also heard the other side that maybe percentage is not the best way to measure oppressiveness of a city. It may just show that a city is poor, essentially. And that some of the West County cities, no, I'm not trying to demean Baldwin, for example, but for example, like Ledoux has had a well-documented racial profiling controversy for years, and it's a situation where they may not be impacted by this bill because it's percentage as opposed to total amount of revenue. So that's something I'm looking at. I'm also looking at transportation issues, and um, you know, maybe they're Maybe I'll write a, a, a preview about the 4th of July in June or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> We're just sticking to legislative issues tonight. We're going to stick to the legislative issues. You were nodding your head. Uh, yes, I, I did want to go to a point dealing with Senate Bill 5. What is really important that your audience should know about is that we changed the definition for revenue. Yeah. And that's what my mayors, um, 41 of them that I represent in the Senate District, they wanted a recalculation. And that is the deal that Senator Schmidt and I, I came to, I said I cannot move forward on Senate Bill 5 unless we get rid of these pass-throughs as well as um, some other items for every single city that they utilize, like the Mules Program, um, which documents all of the different stops in various municipalities and jurisdictions. With that, uh, many of the mayors went back and recalculated what their revenue would be, and many of them got to under 10%. So some of them were at 
fifteen percent, they went down to seven percent or nine percent. But you literally had like the St. Louis County domestic violence um, pass through. You had the Chiefs uh, pass through and multiple the Post pass through. Um, and police training. Those are all pass-throughs that should not be within the definition of what revenue is. But what I am concerned about that I've heard um, recently from my, my constituents is that because some municipalities see Senate Bill 5 as taking away revenue, there might be some municipalities that are trying to fine individuals on their homes and their different ordinances. Yeah. I just would, and you'll, you can rest easy, the point that you made on the odd side of that comment is, is in the article. So there you go. Good to know. Good to know. One of the things I've been wondering, uh, and Senator Chappelle Nadal probably has a better handle on this, is whether or not a fallout from that bill could force some of these really tiny communities like Charlac or St. John or others to have to merge, or at least to talk among themselves. I think there's, there's the, there's the realities of having to maybe merge together as opposed to the political reality if she's got 41 mayors and if that means 10 of them are going to lose their jobs they don't want that or they might just yeah. they might combine services and, and I'm, I'm sure the senator so. knows more than I do because you, you, right. you meet with your mayors I as you said on a quarterly meetings. basis yes. but I've heard kind of both scenarios like it's possible some of the cities may voluntarily merge with each other and potentially become you know potentially stronger municipality because mm -hmm. they may have a stronger tax base with more population but you know I think that some may fight this bill tooth and nail and there's some that may disincorporate possibly there's a lot of what ifs here but you know for example merging municipalities it could go either way it could be a good thing for those cities or it could be a not so good thing it it's hard be, to say it would be a great precedent to set to have some disincorporation some mergers just to put a new, put a paradigm shift down there because we never think in terms of getting rid of cities. We never think in terms of merging, I mean, except for city and county perhaps, but we don't talk about some of the more practical mergers and I, I think that that would be a great example. New institutions for, for uh, when times have changed, for, for new needs. The counties and change, those cities change. The current population, instead of a, a, a present population living under some arrangement that was made two or three generations ago or more, now, if the, the people who are there now can actually shape the institution. Now, you're not suggesting in the St. Louis region we have a, 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 a tendency to, to protect our turf. <laughs> <laughs> this is not just in St. Louis. We have learned it from Illinois. Like, you ever been to Parma, Missouri? Yeah. You ever been to Parma? You ever heard of Parma? I have heard of Parma. It, Parma it broke out. Yeah. There's actually, there's Parma's had about 600 people in it. It's been a, almost a dying town since the 1990s when a factory left. There's actually another small municipality close to it called Pinnerman. Anybody ever, ever heard of Pinnerman? There's about 30 people live in Pinnerman, Missouri. <laughs> so it's not just St. Louis. It's all across rural Missouri. Now, these municipalities are going to defy the state government as long as they can. Yeah. And they're going to do exactly what Senator Chappelle and Nadal talked about. They're going to increase property fines. They're going to find some way maybe to maybe increase a little bit property taxes, like, which they haven't, been, haven't had to do in a long time. They're going to find a way to defy the art state government, and they're going to stay alive. And they're going to, and just to your, to your, you're being a little facetious, but they're going to keep their fiefdom them in, we're going to have to do a, do something a little bit more creative and a little more nourishing in order to get. And them there's to some pride the there too. There's some there's some identity there. It's not just. Well, there are uh, some people that you know like living in smaller yeah. cities where right. they can like see their mayor walking down the street right. as opposed to living in a city like St. Louis City, where although, you know, I could see my aldermen because there's thirty thousand aldermen in St. Louis, but, you know, the government is bigger and it can be more remote from everybody. And I obviously you know. What Charlotte has what like thirty? I'm thinking of Champ. Champ has like thirty people yeah, or something. Yeah, I used so, to have Champ in my district. So there are some extreme examples, but even like some of the smaller cities in your your district, like Greendale, Belleville, Village Hills, it's people ridiculous. like living in those. It, it, and, and let me just tell you, there are multiple things that you have to consider when we have this conversation. One, service delivery. I've had four tornadoes in my district. In 2006, I had some tremendous storms where our electricity was out for about two weeks. Um, and then we had the floods where two of my senior citizens died and ended up in the Mississippi River. So you care about service delivery. So you can um, reduce the number of municipalities, but when you have a natural disaster 
or since we're dealing with Ferguson, we're in that age, you, you have to consider what service delivery is going to look like. And right now, I don't have confidence in St. Louis County uh, government to be able to deliver those services because they haven't in the last 11 years. Now, it may get better in the future, but part of the reason many of my municipalities are working together and they're cost sharing a lot of the overhead. There are some mayors that are out there who are shoveling their own snow because they can't afford it. And so that's what we have to be concerned about. But here's another point that we all should be cognizant of. There are several bills, including um, Senate Bill 199, not 190, that's the deadly force bill, but there are several different bills that we had in the legislature this year that would take money away from municipalities and cause school districts to increase their tax levies as well as municipalities. So let's be fair. You know, we are, are making these municipalities way more accountable, but at the same time, at the state level, we cannot take away that tax base that is so important to communities that look like mine. Are you talking that, about the pool tax situation? Not just the pool tax. Give Andy the last word. Yeah. I want to jump in. I think the one of the underlying problems here is the Hancock Amendment. Politicians are afraid to put any tax increase on the ballot. It won't pass if it goes. And that's why we're in this court, this traffic fine problem. The Hancock Amendment says you Be can't tell them to do something that you, you don't can't give them raise, money for. You can't raise taxes without a vote of the people. And that functionally has stopped tax increases. We have starved our municipalities. And it has the restrictions on how much uh, uh, additional income a community can bring in without having to reduce their tax rate, like if they get a certain higher percentage, unless there's been extra development. It's, it's, the Hancock Amendment has really changed how okay, things We've got to leave it there because they've worn out the guys with the cameras on their shoulders. <laughs> thanks, thanks for sticking with us.